was and always has been a very indoor focus to the creative process for many artists. I remember reading an essay in which Claude Monet commented that because of Impressionism, art had broken out of the dark, dreary walls of the museum and into the bright sunshine. To be an artist means remaining connected with the observable world. Plain air painting, the French words literally mean open air painting, is the core of my life as a studio artist. It is by returning wide-eyed to encounter nature again and again that emotions, impressions, and inspiration can grow. Life itself is the foundation of the most significant art of every generation. is something very jewel-like about a plein air. It is a small piece of canvas that has been crafted and done on location and the brushwork has a great sense of reality to it, a great sense of authenticity. Here's just a random sampling of a few recent uh, plein air paintings. Every one of these is an experience just etched in my mind, an indelible memory uh, that is recorded in paint. For example, Napa Valley. I was recently in the Napa Valley. Now, of course, Napa Valley is known for the wine uh, that comes from that region, but it's also a beautiful region uh, in terms of wildflowers. And one of the great things is they have so many fields of mustard, and the mustard just comes up underneath all the vineyards. And so when I was here, of course, the mustard was starting to come up, and you can see it. It was an overcast day, and yet you look in the distance and you can see the hills on the other side of the valley. Just a little barn, just a pastoral scene as I sat there and, and sketched in the fresh air and watched the daily activities of the farm. People would come out and work and go back in, and they never noticed me over there standing, there, standing in their field. Uh, if they had, they probably would have come over and asked me to pitch in and do some work. But, um, you know, what a memory uh, to have been in Napa Valley. And we go from there to regions as diverse as uh, the island of Maui. Again, just here's a setting, a beautiful setting that I stumbled upon with a pond and it had lily pads and the beautiful ferns and uh, palm trees and so forth that were growing along the banks. And I just set up and in an hour or two uh, recorded the beauty of this tranquil setting. Later that uh, week, or it may have even been earlier in the week, I set up and did a, a view on a beach, just a typical Hawaiian beach with the distant clouds. This is the other side of Maui. You can see up here in the distance another island that's actually the same island. It's the other end of Maui as it sort of makes a L and goes back around. And the clouds are gathered up on the top of the mountain there. But again, sitting in the sunlight, um, hearing the sound of waves crashing in the distance, the smell of the ocean, seagulls overhead. You know, it doesn't get much better than that. In a world in which information is coming at us from all sources, immediately, the computers are in everything we pick up, whether they are toys or telephones. At this moment in time, when we seem to be so programmed and so accessible, I mean, where things are so accessible to us, I think we have a way of responding to that by in some way going backwards in time to something which is more tangible, which is more immediate, which is more lasting, as it were. We go back to nature, we go back to family, we go back to religion, we go back to the things which have always been there. The values, the support systems, um, that really have nothing to do with computer chips, which have nothing to do with speed and technology and, and all of these services which are available to us. It isn't to say that those things are necessarily bad, but I don't think they really address the fabric and the fiber of our lives, which is really tied up in things much more long-lasting and permanent and important in many ways than all of these gadgets that are available to us. So I think artists in general today and Thomas Kincaid in particular are really addressing that. It's, they're giving us the handmade, they're giving us the things which have been there before. 
You can look at a Thomas Kincaid painting of Yosemite and you can then go to a museum and see a painting by Bierstadt of the exact same location. Now, I'm not too far from a location. In fact, I think this probably is the exact location where Albert Bierstadt painted in the 1880s. And when I came back to Yosemite after seeing that, I thought, I'm gonna track down the exact location where Albert Bierstadt painted. Now, for those of you who don't know, Albert Bierstadt is a very famous American epic landscape painter. I number him in the top five of people who've influenced me and influenced my work. He was a 19th century painter but he painted luminous sunsets and dramatic vistas of Yosemite Valley. Very emotionally charged, very little connection to what you really see. I mean, he idealized it quite a bit. You know, there's something about being an artist and being on location. Uh, I can't explain it to, to artists who tell me, no, I don't want to do that. And I try to explain, and they say, well, I get it just as much by just going on location and maybe taking my sketchbook and taking a few photographs and coming home. Well, believe me, it's a different experience when you sit down and you're watching the waterfall and you're watching the mist go over those mountains. What a fascinating and beautiful uh, statement of God's grace as we look out at this setting. The choice of materials and process is imp very important with plein air painting, most importantly because you have to carry everything with you normally, in generally speaking. I mean, the normal routine is for somebody to travel to England or to hike up a hill. And anybody who's involved in outdoor sports knows that every additional ounce is something, is an ounce that you're going to have to carry with you for miles and for hours at a time. So you better be sure that you want that extra weight, that it's important to the process. So a plein air painter will make sure that he or she has only the essentials, only things which support the process, which are adaptable to the process, and will be useful in creating the painting. Thomas has to choose the right supplies, just as any other plein air painter would be choosing their supplies for the portability, lightweight, carrying facility, and also the, the range of, of expression that's possible once you get to that location. And then you have to come up with the paints. What paints will I need in order to get the most out of this scene? What brushes will help me achieve that? What kind of surface will I paint on? Those are all decisions you have to make when you're getting ready to, to paint. And Thomas Kincaid has talked about the fact that that preparation is also part of the mental process involved in getting yourself ready for the experience. Now what I have here to, to begin to illustrate the nuts and bolts of plein air painting. This is a complete studio. This is every bit as equipped as the studio that I normally utilize in my indoor finished painting technique. My studio setup here consists of a wide array of brushes. We have about six or seven different types of brush I use. Everything from broad stroke brushes to, to fine point brushes to stipple brushes, which are brushes that you use pointing straight at the canvas as opposed to stroking. And all of those brushes, and combined with the 20 color palette, I use 20 different colors, including white, to mix on all this big setup here and this huge easel and all the other material and paraphernalia uh, is what is involved in doing a studio work. Well, this is all that's involved in doing plein air technique. This little backpack can be packed up and taken with me into a beach somewhere, 100 miles from nowhere, and I can actually create finished works using this, this setup. Now, let me open it up and give you a little guided tour of the plein air uh, studio. This uh, is an ordinary camera tripod. It's a rather a nice tripod in that it has uh, some features that I find really, really useful. Uh, for example, um, it's got complete universal movement on the head here. And it also doesn't have the traditional screw mount that you find on most tripods, uh, but it has a clip mount. Now, what I've done is I've taken my painting box, which is just, this started out just as a kind of a wooden box that I've uh, just gradually modified. I mounted a brushed aluminum plate. It's about an eighth inch aluminum plate on the bottom. Onto that, I mounted the camera tripod plate. 
Now, the great advantage of that is that now I can take this and it literally just sets on there and that's all you have to do. It just clips right on there and we have a ready-made setup. Now, this tripod pod has another advantage in that the legs have a three position fix so that they can be the standard uh, position and two other larger angles which give us the ability to work very low and still have about a three foot diameter uh, mount. So <clears throat> great stability in the wind. Now when you open this up, and I'll turn it around so we can all see, um, when you open it up we have a box that features just about everything I need. Now instead of my 20 color palette that I utilize uh, in the studio, I utilize five colors, a simple five color palette. There's a yellow, there's a red, there's a mid-tone brown, there's a luminous green, and a blue. Five colors plus white make up the palette and it pretty much allows you to mix uh, anything you want uh, and, uh, and to represent just about any, any color you can find in nature. Underneath the uh, palette, uh, we see the various paraphernalia. I have an assortment of brushes, um, container for turpentine, uh, the tubes of paint themselves, uh, and believe it or not, I even have a mall stick or painting stick that I utilize uh, that folds right up and goes into my palette so that I can keep my hand suspended above my mixing area and above the painting so I can still do detail uh, with the painting. There's a great love of detail and a great love of the mood that you can get in a studio work, but I also find a great love of the explosion of energy that you get outdoors uh, when you are setting up and painting direct from nature. I heard a great painter one time say that when you work in the studio, you paint. When you work outdoors, it paints. And it's really true. The painting sort of paints itself. Nature tells you what to do. And uh, your job as an artist is to put it together in as quick a fashion as you can. And those paintings retain a spark of charm to them that you just don't get in any other kind of work. It's almost as though if it's a seaside scene, you can sort of sense that little pebbles of sand are embedded in the paint. Or if it's a street scene, you have the dust of the street in the paint somehow. One painter put it this way, that it was as though fresh air were captured on canvas. He recognizes that people have hard lives, that things don't always go the way you'd like it. It's not that he or anyone else is naive or is it an escapist, they're saying that, look, we know all of that exists. Why do we have to dwell on it? Why can't we talk about something that lifts us up, that makes us appreciate life to a greater extent? And he believes, and I believe along with him, is that it's something an artist can do that maybe a musician or writer can do, but very few people get that opportunity to say, I can make your life richer, more enjoyable, I can give you a kind of pleasure that is different than anything else you can enjoy as a person. I can show you something magnificently beautiful. I can help you look at the sky when at the sun is setting and the colors are golden and the clouds are like these imaginative forms out in the space and say that this is such one of those unusual things which you're lucky enough to experience and to remember through the painting. What a wonderful thing to have happen in a person's life to share that experience through Thomas Kincaid's paintings. There's no question that because of Thomas Kincaid's career and his ability to share his work with thousands and thousands of people, he's one of the most influential artists alive today. His paintings have allowed him to share his vision with a greater number of people than probably any other living artist. And you know, so that makes him, by definition, a very important contemporary artist, somebody who is part of the American culture, part of the international culture, really, because he is doing what an artist is supposed to do and what an artist does better than anybody else, which is to share his or her view of the world, his or her experience in the world, to make it part of everyone's experience.